All right, welcome again, and welcome back to those who of you who have been here with us for a few minutes. My name is Muzam al Hussein. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Michigan in the Department of Communication and Media. I'm also the associate director for the Center for Middle East and North African Studies and the Center for uh, Global Islamic Studies uh, in the International Institute. Uh, you are here joining us at the uh, Center for Middle East and North African Studies Fall Colloquium Series. Um, the Center for Middle East North African Studies and, and the study of the region began at our university as late as, late as uh, 1889. Um, and since the inception of the program for Middle Eastern and North African Studies, which began in 1961, our university has had a great uh, commitment and interest in uh, research, teaching, and public service uh, uh, towards the region through engagement with the language, the culture, the economy, and the societies in this diverse part of the world. Um, and so today we're also a national resource center uh, funded by the US Department of Education. And that situates our fall colloquium in that we, um, uh, we bring in uh, experts from around the world on a given theme every fall semester of the academic year. Our theme this year, uh, is higher education and reformation across the MENA, uh, a geopolitical exploration. For seven weeks uh, this fall, uh, we have multiple presentations on each of seven days. Today's theme in this broader topic of higher education and reformation in the region, we will be exploring experts who focus uh, their scholarship and investigation on the topics of debate and innovation. Um, and we're lucky to have the co our co-sponsor the School of Education Center for the Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Education uh, in, in, in sponsoring this work uh, for or today's uh, uh, proceedings. Um, as a brief uh, special uh, comment, uh, I want to also acknowledge the beautiful background here, which uh, this photograph uh, is just uh, about an hour and a half old. Um, today is a unique day for me because I have the pleasure of calling in from my, uh, our, our presenters, um, Dr. Ondar Kucheral and Rahmi Uruj uh, at Ibn Khaldun University uh, next to the Suleymaniya, Suleymaniya Mosque in Istanbul. I'm here for a separate workshop, but uh, uh, very, very pleased and uh, happy to have the pleasure of uh, being with some of our presenters in, in person uh, this fall. Uh, we also have Drs. Uh, Mohammed Nishat Faisal and Fauzia Jabin calling in from the GCC. So I'm grateful for all of these presenters' time, taking time in their late evenings to share uh, their expertise and their projects with us on this important uh, issue. Um, our agenda is simple in three parts. Uh, we'll first begin with um, uh, Professor Kokucheral and Dr. Uruç from Ibn Haldun University in Turkey, um, where they're part of the uh, Alliance of Civilizations Institute at Ibn Haldun University. They will first present for 20 to 30 minutes on the topic, Adab in Dialogue, Developing Argumentative Virtue in a Divided World via the Munazara Engagement Model. After hearing from them, we'll continue to listen uh, from uh, Professor Mohammed Nishat Faisal and uh, uh, Professor Fauzia Jabin and their co-author, Marios Katsiolotis. Uh, they are from diverse universities uh, at Abu Dhabi University in the UAE, the American University of Cyprus in Cyprus, and Qatar University uh, in, in Doha, Qatar. Uh, they are business school professors with backgrounds in international strategy, international business, management, uh, and, uh, and, and marketing research. And they will be presenting their co-authored project, uh, Entrepreneurial Mindset and the Role of Universities as Strategic Drivers of Entrepreneurship, Evidence from the UAE. Pre uh, proceeding from these uh, 40 to 60 minutes of uh, two presentations. We will break for a public Q&A session um, for about 15 to 20 minutes. So at that time, please use the Q&A tool on Zoom to provide your questions, and I will moderate a Q&A session for that time. After that, we will conclude and take a five-minute break and reconvene with uh, our students enrolled in, in a course related to this colloquium for a 20 to 30-minute uh, intimate discussion about the scholarship our, our scholars um, and, um, uh, and, and a broader discussion about their research programs, a broader and deeper uh, discussion around that. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like now to welcome uh, Drs. Kuchukural and Uruch to present their work 
uh, please go ahead and slide, uh, share your slides and we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, we want to thank Dr. Hussein and the Michigan University for inviting us. And we want to thank uh, Christian for the help throughout the process. Uh, you know, today, we will be talking about the ADAP in Dialogue project that we are conducting with, uh, with the members of Argument Nazara Research Center in Ibn Khaldun University. And uh, uh, for Argument Nazara Research Center. And uh, we will be talking about the ADAP project and why we have chosen ADAP as our intervention to contemporary debate models which are very popular in the in the university context. You know, I, I think especially the students of uh, students from US will know how prevalent they are, how how such an institution they serve, and with the role they play in the higher institution. And we have previously shared with you a paper which is likely and we, which is which will be soon published in the uh, informal logic paper in informal logic journal, and. Uh, in this paper, we talk about Munazra's contribution to contemporary argumentation theories. But here, we are going to go, we are going to take a practical uh, approach and we are going, in the other project, we will be talking about the practical application of Munazra in today's context. You know, uh, the, the, uh, let me continue with this. First, we are going to present ourselves. First, I will be presenting myself. I will be introducing myself and then Under Hoja, will introduce himself and then we will, we will uh, continue. So my name is Rahmi Uruj. I just recently finished my PhD and it was about Munazara and how can we situate Munazara in contemporary argumentation scholarship. Uh, beforehand, I majored in and I'm still working in the comparative literature department, but I had the, uh, I had the extreme opportunity to study with, uh, study with a traditional master traditional um, molla as the way we call them um, to I have the, uh, the the privilege to work with him and there I realized the so I am I'm, I'm coming from a I'm coming from a uh, I, I was I was in a very prestigious university uh, things were very nice I was happy but I felt like you know there was some more need there was some a lot of work to be done and I felt that you know the madrasa sciences, especially the Munazara that we are going to discuss, has a lot to share. Uh, and now I am giving the floor to Dr. Undar Kuchkural. Yeah, it was our pleasure actually uh, to, uh, to see the defense of Rahmi Oruç, Dr. Rahmi Oruç very recently, and he just finished his nice PhD and it's been a very nice inspiration for all of us. I am Önder Kuchkural. Uh, I did my PhD in political science department at Sabancı University in Istanbul. And later, I and my PhD was on religious reasoning, and because study of religious reasoning and its implications for democracy. And then we, with, with a team of researchers, we published two books. One was on religiosity in Turkey, and the other, the second one was spiritual seeking in Turkey. Now I'm doing another project, the third one on non-religion in Turkey. Yeah, and then we are also doing this Adab with Basval Munazara research together with the team in uh, Ibn Aldo University. Thank you very much, Hojam. So uh, first of all, I want to talk to you about our center. So as I we said, um, as the way we call it, it's called Argu Munazara. It's a bit cheesy, Argumentation and Munazara. Uh, but we like the acronym. So our, our center is Munazara and Argumentation Ethics Center, Ethics Research Center. We are part of Ibn Khaldun University and uh, at the moment, we are conducting four research projects. They are very nice. One of them, uh, under Hoja has discussed the non-religious. But today, we are going to be talking about the Adab in dialogue, which is also in the title. But first, I want to introduce you uh, with some of our members. You know, the the exact list is too much. There are lots of other people, but you know, these are the valuable members that we are doing the project together. Now, uh, what are we going to do? I just want to give you an outline. In this outline, first, we are going to discuss about what is Munazara. You know, I, I reckon that, you know, there might be some people who are not aware of the uh, topic, to be honest, which is extremely normal. And then I will be talking about Munazara's place in the Muslim higher education, which is the Madrasa, and how this Munazara is situated in the Madrasa curriculum 
in the old times, in the old times. And then I will be talking about the state of Munazara studies, state of Muslim argumentation studies in theory and the practice. After talking about this, I will give the floor to Dr. Shukural to discuss why we envision the Munazara engagement model and what the ADAP project is doing in terms of deliverables and our future goals and visions. So what is Munazara? Munazara is actually short for Adab al basb al Munazara. And the literal translation of these Arabic terms are manners of inquiry and argumentation. However, a more technical argumentation theory induced translation would be virtuous conduct for monological and biological argumentation. So Munazara in the secondary literature is viewed as a revolution in the historical tra trajectory of Muslim argumentation scholarship by the prominent authors of the paper that we are citing here. So I want to give you a small, uh, a, a very short uh, trajectory of timeline of Muslim argumentation studies. Uh, so I have deliberately write, wrote here, the, uh, what is Munazara? Munazara is a synthesis of Muslim ethics and Aristotelian dialectics. So uh, what do I mean by this? So uh, you, can, you can describe, you can divide the Muslim argumentation scholarship into four elements. And in the beginning, in the beginning, you have the ikhtilaf literature or the disagreements between pious imams, where we learned that you know, there are argumentation tools, sources, norms that were bequeathed from the Sahaba, the friends of the prophet. So th their, their ethics, uh, starts the discussion. Then you have fully systematized argumentation theories in juridical and theological debates. Then in the, in the end of the 13th century, you have, uh, in the end of 20th century, uh, you have the Munazara. So Munazara, what makes Munazara different is that Munazara is context and issue independent. In the old times, we were debating issues about, you know, juridical debates, theological debates. But now with Munazara, it is, context and issue independent and you know we can also say that there is a early munazara and modern munazara and the modern munazara is where the fully technical logical terminology becomes part of the discipline and uh, unfortunately uh, 19th century onwards with the modernization period you see a decline of the uh, the, the application and the usage and the learn and the learning of the, the theory but still Still, this is very this is very important. Munazara actually uh, proves that you know there was no repetitive process. Like you know, there is this idea that after the classical age, Muslims they started to just repeat themselves. But as as Ruhaib in his very influential book uh, proves, no, this was not the case. Uh, let me give you so the, the basic ideas like you know the commentaries and super commentaries and glosses. There are just repetitions of the uh, earlier literature, but we see that you know this is a very this is a timeline that we have uh, we have prepared for our project. You can see that you know from 13th century onwards to 20th century, you know unfortunately dwindling by the, by the 19th century, this munazara the argumentation theory has become a staple of the Muslim intellectual endeavor. So, so what is the Munazara's place in the Madrasa curriculum? In the Madrasa curriculum, you have, uh, broadly speaking, you have two, 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 uh, two fields. You have the auxiliary sciences, and then you have the supreme sciences. The auxiliary sciences are like philological disciplines and pragmatics, ilm al wada for those who know Arabic. And then you have logic, Munazara, rhetoric as the auxiliary sciences. So the idea is, in order to reach to the supreme sciences or the higher end sciences, you need to master these disciplines and Munazara being one of them. The supreme sciences also, they are divided into transmitted and rational. So transmitted, you can say theology and kalam and uh, hadith. And when it comes to the rational sciences, geometry, chemistry. So the Muslims believed in their, in their higher education environment that you need to master auxiliary sciences you need to master pragmatics, logic, Munazara, rhetoric to be able to speak about the supreme sciences. So this is something that you know I also I personally share 
with the uh, with I, I am sharing the sentiment as well. I we today we are doing this project, the other project because we felt the need that there is an there is, there is we we need to have a virtuous and analytical debating environment, and we need to somehow inculcate inculcate the, uh, the we need to promote the virtues, and we need to promote the good use of logic and dialectics. So I let me just briefly talk about the state of theoretical work on Minazara. Unfortunately, only a handful of people have been working on Minazara. And even so there are these major figures like Walter Edward Young, Larry Miller, uh, but and then Shamsettin Arif. To, unfortunately, you can count these names. And even fever, there exists even fever, Munazara transitions and critical editions. And Munazara is being treated as obsolete in the sense that, you know, it's intellectual history in this it's, it's past of the it's Muslim past. You know, maybe we need to learn about this as part of intellectual history, but not as an alternative to contemporary theories. So as a, as, as a result of this, there is no systematic studies projects to revive Munazara. And we believe that ours is a really, really humble start. And we need to, we thank uh, Dr. Muzammil for the suggestion. I think for suggestion of the title, you know, we believe that, you know, this is just the beginning and we will see inshallah how things will proceed. And now let me talk to you about the state of practical work of Munazara. So Munazara, the argumentation theory and practice. So in the MENA region actually, and also beyond in the Muslim majority countries, there are major institutions in Qatar and Malaysia working on debating, but they follow the dominant British parliamentary model. So basically they use the British parliamentary model of debating uh, in their, you know, in their work. Unfortunately, these institutions are not aware of the Munazara theory and practice. However, I think we, we think that, you know, there is hope because there is a growing frustration with the dominant models and there is an appreciation of Munazara and in this, just in this talk, uh, in this, this screen share that I'm sharing with you is uh, where the, the, the very influential speaker is trying to convince people why the classical Islamic Munazara should be chosen over the contemporary models. And actually we are sharing this sentiment as well. Now this, my part of the presentation is ending, and now I will uh, I will give the floor to Dr. Kshkural to continue. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much, Ms. Emil. We don't hear you. Hmm? Yes. Do, do you hear me now? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this great opportunity to share our ideas and our, our uh, project with this distinguished community and the people who are specializing in education sector. Um, um, why, why we prioritize Munazara over the other ones, over the other hegemonic models, like British parliamentary procedure or other models. Uh, we, first of all, we, what, as a team of researchers, what we think is we should revive this old tradition. As you see, it's been like hundreds of years in this soil, uh, Muslim ulama and Muslim students used to practice this debate in the university context. And it has disappeared in 19th century. And maybe it is more congruent with the cultural context or intellectual context here. So we, we thought we should excavate this old tradition. So we, we actually call this thing and we, we started with the university practice, university debates actually to, to, to first intervene and to um, create our model. And we call this model, uh, not tournament, not competition, but Munazara engagement model to be, to be actually used firstly in university debates. So this uh, Munazara engagement model is a, the practical application of a new approach to argumentation. Driving on the Munazara tradition, we highlight the importance of ada, which means virtuous conduct, even for the analytical truth to emerge. It's, just, it's not just virtuous conduct, but also it cares for the analytical truth. Can you? Yeah. So why actually we want to do this? Actually, the first aim is, I am an argumentation scholar, actually, and for last, I don't know, six, seven years, I'm studying argumentation literature. If you read argumentation literature, you came across, you come across a typical narrative. It starts with Aristotle, the ancient Greece, Greek tradition, uh, famous the logic, rhetoric, and dialectics. 
And then it jumps to 19, actually 58, uh, famous Perelman and Toulmin's book. And it's as if there's a huge lacuna between this from the old tradition to the 1950s. But actually, when you look into the, uh, this Muslim scholars' uh, struggles on creating their discipline, there are centuries, centuries old, thousands, hundreds of books actually written on this uh, argumentation field. And this field is somehow uh, does not, people, do, the uh, scholars do, doesn't recognize this huge actually tradition in argumentation. So what, what we think is when you study argumentation, we come to realize that actually the insights that this ulema was sharing with us would help today's argumentation scholars. And besides, it's not just Muslims, of course, there are this Indian, Chinese, and other civilizations that their own argumentation theories and practices think, given the fact that they are coming from oral tradition and they were actually experts, let's say, in the way they use language, their tongue, and we can really look back to understand what actually they were doing and what, what they were actually achieving in, in those old days. Actually, in this building, very building, they were practicing this tradition, but it's 19th century as uh, Rahmi said it's disappeared, suddenly disappeared. And then we, we all in the world, even with the name of Munazara, we start actually doing British parliamentary debates in, in the universities. Uh, and besides, if you look at today's contemporary debate cultures, you realize that, especially with the help of social media, you realize that there are all of debates going on, but we only hear our own position most of the time. We don't really engage in a genuine debate with the other. So we keep hearing our own well-known arguments, but we hardly know what the other party is actually saying most of the time. And due to uh, this today's uh, debate practice, which is based on duration, actually the time, we just, the, uh, people are given, let's say, uh, fixed time like 10 minutes, seven minutes speeches, and you hardly hear what do they say to others' arguments. So in this old model, models, uh, actually they, they are coming up on entirely different kind of, let's say, procedure. And we think if we make a slight difference in the procedure, it might inculcate some virtues, let's say, on the, the way we debate, the way we think also in our own academic settings. So what we, uh, in, in today's, let's say, general argumentation practice, debate practice, the winning is valorized. This is the most, important thing that everyone should achieve. Like two teams are competing with and it's competition oriented and it doesn't really care for truth or common good, let's say. So, but in this Minazara engagement model, what we aim is to promote other caring virtues as well as argumentative skills. It's not just virtues. We know that it's adversarial. There are differences of opinions, there are disagreements, but at the same time, we can logically discuss with each other, but at the same time, we can care for virtues. This is what the old, let's say, ulema used to say. And Imam Shafi what used to say, it's well known, by the way, used to say, it is the same for me whether wisdom and truth come from my mouth or my opponents, or, or my man or my opponents. Mind. It's not important, he said. And he sees, actually, argumentation as a way to reach the truth, not a debate to be won. This is, this is extremely important. In, if you, let's say, let's see how Today's argumentation practice is achieved. Just this is coming from 2016 championship between uh, Harvard and Clements uh, finals. But this is how it is actually done today. Can you show it, Rahmi? Just. So did you, did you understand anything? <laughs> I should ask. Anyway, by the way, this is not an unusual thing. If you read Scott Jacobs, on there, sorry to interrupt. I, I rarely do this, but I wanted some context because I think a lot of viewers yeah. will be wondering about the situation. So what I uh, observed was um, someone presenting and talking extremely fast. So I think they're pushing their content of evidence and argument out as quickly as possible in a narrow constrained time. Is that accurate? And what other contextual information do we need to 
make sense of this? Actually, this is a typical university championship practice. If you look at Scott Jacobs article, this is how it is usually done. I think people who are in this room, I guess, who are specialized in university debate practice, they would know they try to actually to win the debate. They try to uh, score as many arguments as possible. So the, the, the number of arguments are crucial for the judges. So they supposed to do it that way to, to win the debate. So, so would a metaphor a be like um, you're kind of in a, a boxing match. And so the number of punches you score on the opponent's argument is how you win. Is that a stretch or is that work? Exactly. exactly. And they say, for instance, they, they are given a motion uh, and, and these motions are well known and they study the motion, let's say, and then they, they, they keep telling all the possible arguments and the judges all, already know the possible arguments or all, all these arguments are well known. So the, the speaker, as you see, the way he, he inhales, the speaker, like in a bullet speed manner, he just gives one, one after another a lot of arguments and then judges simply, as you see the guy here, they, they, they simply make the score and then they determine the winner. And the more okay. you can do, the better you are. Thank you for that uh, interruption or uh, dealing with my interruption. We are at the 20 minute mark, but due to my uh, two minutes of uh, uh, interruption, we can uh, say that there's 12 minutes left. So, yeah. you know, uh, let's, let me add uh, something here. So, you know, you will see, you will see that, you know, the idea here that we are having is, uh, it's not just about, it's not just, so first of all, we see that, you know, there, there needs to be some intervention here in the sense that, you know, we need to be hearing both sides. And this is the first idea that we are having. So there should be a dialogical interaction. And, and shortly, uh, Under Hoja will show the examples. And then we also believe that, you know, there, is, there shouldn't be time limitations. So our new model that we are planning to, uh, uh, planning to design, we are hoping that, you know, there will not be any time limitations, but instead there will be argumentative limitations. And this is, and also you will see that, you know, this, we believe that this idea of somebody going into a stage and making a speech rather than engaging with the other party, it fuels into this whole echo chambers and the, uh, the polar, polar, proliferation of public uh, polarization and deep disagreements. Yeah. Exactly. And you are speaking to the audiences. As you see, can you change the slide? Yeah, so in the old times, this, let's say, Munazara scholars actually used to prioritize not the periods, like fixed time periods, but actually they try to regulate the moods of the arguers. So this is, this is very weird. We didn't see uh, in the literature anything similar to this one. That's why we thought this can be a very good contribution to today's actually debate practice, not only in universities, but also like parliaments in other contexts as well, but we will start with university debate practice. So what the Munazara scholars for centuries actually tried and this procedure was somehow developed by them and we tried to adapt this to the contemporary, this is the aim of our project by the way, to the contemporary debate practice. So first, what does the, first that we have of course two parties here, the one, one side we have the claimant, the other side the respondent, questioner and the uh, questioner and the claimant, you can say. The first, the claimant makes the argument with the premises for the claim. And then respondent does only object to the premise in the argument. I will explain this with, some, with an example later. So we call it as man. Yani the, in Arabic, it is called man, mana. And the claimant, after hearing the objection, can defend his premise or can bring a new argument instead. And hearing respondent would refute this time the whole argument, if, if you want. This is called nakas, nakat. And, and then claimant would defend the argument or can he can bring new arguments in response to this refutation in the second round. So in the and only after third round, uh, in the third move the respondent can, can come up with a counter argument, which is called muarada. And the minute the respondent can, uh, can come up with a counter argument, meaning like new arguments, th this time now they switch their roles. This is how they were prescribing. And now this time the respondent becomes the claimant after he come, come up with a counter argument. 
Can you, with an example, you will understand it better. Can you go to the next one? Yeah. For instance, uh, let's say your friend says this wall is white. And it's very easy, for instance, this is how actually I end up doing to my wife most of the time. Actually, we, we all <laughs> do it this way. You immediately want to say, no, it is not white, but it's black. So we, what we say is, congratulations, you have stolen your friend's right to prove her claim. Normally. So what the Muslim scholars used to say, you shouldn't just say, come up with your counter argument, but first you should do an objection, manner, so that you give the burden of proof to the other party and you give it place for the other party to uh, explain its position. So you, you, are, you are here to say first, what do you, why do you think it is white? You don't say it's black immediately. So you should do a mana first, objection. And then after she, he might, the respondent, uh, sorry, questioner, uh, sorry, claimant, they say why she, he thinks it's white, then you might then refute the whole argument like, no, we don't call it white here because you, you can come up with your reason. After hearing this, uh, you can, in the, in the third stage or third move, you can come up with your counter argument. I think it's not white, white, but it's gray because, and then you shift roles. This is the way uh, Munazara scholars used to prescribe in, in, in those days. Can you go on? So we have just a few minutes left. So what are we doing in this project now? As you see, this is a, it seems very, very easy, but th there's a huge discussion debate between and you know, behind this thing that they, the scholars discuss. Actually, this is the article that we gave you, which sequence is the best to achieve the, the goal of truth, to reach the truth in the end, not to win the argument. So they were, they were discussing this. Yeah, we, are, we, we will not use all the seven minutes. Yeah, so what, in this project, what we do is first, uh, we already excavated and found in the, in the uh, libraries in, in this soil that more than 150 pieces we uncovered, this 150 books actually written in all these centuries. And they say there are even more than this 150 books on, on, on this, this issue. So in this project, we are actually translating three key Minazara texts so that they will be reference books for those who are actually interested in understanding more this Minazara. And then lastly, this is the most challenging part, to adapt this Minazara to the contemporary debate environment. So we, we will call this Minazara engagement model for inter-varsity debates. Yani Actually, if we succeed in this one, in our next project, we will actually organize intervarsity debates, to, uh, competitions, not competitions, but meetings, we call it. So uh, first, in, in the next stage, we will establish Minazara clubs worldwide, particularly in the Muslim world. And we think maybe this model is much more concurrent to this world, let's say this part of the world's uh, disagreement management. Uh, we will also create some Minazara training, coaching training, and judging training sessions and uh, toolkits we will create later to uh, uh, disseminate this Minazara worldwide. And we will do some empirical research on Minazara. And do, does it really cultivate analytical, uh, it increases analytical capabilities of the students? And does, does, does it really cultivate virtues? By the way, it's very difficult to cultivate virtues overnight, but we believe this, this the change in the way we actually argue with one another slowly and coming up with good arguments against each other, it would also enhance our logical capabilities, both logical and virtuous capabilities. We need to listen to the other side. So today, we know that you don't need to listen to the other side. As, as, as more arguments you score, the, the, the stronger you will be. So examining Minazara's potential contribution to diverse fields, such as as, as I was saying, in conflict resolution, arbitration, and psychotherapy, even in, in political parliaments, let's say, we can even uh, flourish this uh, practice in other venues. So we will promote use of, as I said, in use of Minazara in the parliaments. This is our overarching aim. Can you go next? So we are over with the slides. Um, Maybe you um, want to Okay. Rami, do you want to say anything? Uh, just so we can finish. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening to us. Like I just want to add that you know the idea, as Under Hoja mentioned, the idea of virtue development and character development, it takes a time. And in order to have this, uh, we believe that you know the contemporary debating environment as an institution. 
with debate clubs, with debate tournaments, with debate trainings, with debate coaching. We believe that you know this is an this is the ground that we need to be working on. So with time, uh, with time, we are hoping that you know the same thing will apply for us as well by repeating, by 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 habituating the skills and the uh, and the let's say uh, characteristic behaviors we will be we will be able to even for ourselves to have these virtues in the divided world thank you very much we are over with the presentation thank you so much um you've done wonderfully with your time management as well you have three minutes left so if uh if i may i, I wanted to do a quick follow-up just to get some more content onto the floor uh, for the Q&A period. So as a quick follow-up, I'm a communication media studies person. And so we have a saying, a famous saying, uh, a maxim, if you will, in our field called the medium is the message. And what that refers to is the idea that it's not always what content you're saying, but the context in which you're saying it. So my question for you is, uh, I can anticipate some portability of this process in written form in digital space, so blogging is a long form discussion and debate environment, which lacks a common structure. Uh, and going back in a very historical context, United States democratic institutions were deliberated and debated through uh, long form uh, written debates in the form of the Federalist Papers. So a brief question for a brief reflection would be, um, have you thought about the portability of this model in other media such as as uh, long form discussion verbally through podcasts or long form written discussion and debate asynchronously through blogging uh, and editorial debates, things of that nature in the news media. May I? Yes. Actually, um, in the project, we are planning an online platform, first of all, to actually, they will write their arguments, Mena, Nakaz, Muaraza, in a online platform and after we understand this like two parties talking to each other in this manner of course as as we were saying we might migrate this thing in other like conflict resolution or in other contexts uh, and, and, Rahmi, do you want to? and also like you know we have this idea that you know it can be part of the critical reading and critical the critical reading and critical writing like you know knowing how to proceed with your with the order the sequence of your arguments will help you with we, we are we believe that you know it's going to help and the ultimate goal uh, to conclude here you know the goal is why not in the future enforce the use of Munazra, this dialogical turn-taking virtues model to be employed in the political parliaments of the world can you imagine in a world where you don't have a politician speaking eight minutes or just doing lies and we don't hear the other person. Can you imagine an environment that we would have where people would have to take you into account and they would have to sit with you next to each other and debate these issues? Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing uh, a new concept to many of us, uh, demonstrating its basic structures and for considering its portability in different spaces. Um, we're looking forward to engaging you in a Q&A um, uh, and it can be a you know, multi-directional conversation across our guest experts today uh, in different institutions, different cultural environments, different disciplines, and also between our uh, public audience coming from around the world and our students who are coming from multiple dis uh, disciplines themselves. So, uh, but we'll, we'll hold further engagement on your project until we hear first from Drs. Jabin and Faisal uh, coming from business management and marketing world will be presenting uh, a project related to uh, the cultivation of entrepreneurial and innovation oriented sensibilities um, in higher education spaces in the UAE. So without further ado, Dr. Faisal, Dr. Jabin, please go ahead and share your screen and um, we'll look forward to hearing you. Please unmute you, Dr. Jabin. Um, you cannot okay. hear. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't start yet. <laughs> okay, so good afternoon and good evening, everyone. So uh, let me just start with the, hold on. Yes, hi, can you see my slides? Yes, very nice. Okay, 
Okay. So, um, hello, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. And uh, uh, well, I can see that, uh, I mean, so first of all, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Muzammil, for inviting us in this uh, session. Uh, I can see, uh, I mean, uh, I started learning learning about Munazara, and I just started thinking how we can uh, bring Munazara in entrepreneurial pitching form. So very, that's a very nice uh, session, and we learned a lot uh, from that. So my name is Professor Fawzia Jabin, and uh, today, along with my co-author, Professor Mohammad Nishat Fasil, uh, we shall be discussing with you some interesting findings of our research on topic entrepreneurial uh, uh, mindset and the role of universities as strategic drivers of entrepreneurship uh, evidence from the United Arab Emirates. So first, uh, we are going to tell a little bit about ourselves, and then we shall be discussing the topic in detail. So uh, Professor Nishat, would you like to please go ahead and tell something about you? Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to Dr. Muzammil for inviting us here. Uh, my name is Mohammad Nishad Faisal. I am. Uh, I did my PhD in supply chain management and mainly I, I work in the area of supply chain management. But on and off, I also touch upon the other areas like sustainability, entrepreneurship and so on. So uh, myself and Dr. Fauzia and Professor Marios, we collaborated on this topic and uh, uh, we published few papers other than this paper, which is related to the entrepreneurship. So this is it. I give it back to Dr. Fauzia. She will take us along. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nishat. Uh, well, a uh, uh, brief introduction about myself. Uh, I'm uh, Fauzia Jabin and uh, uh, people who are from West, uh, the meaning of my name is Victory, so you can call me Victoria as well. And uh, I currently I'm working as a professor of management in the College of Business at Abu Dhabi University. Uh, also, I'm the chapter advisor of Beta Gamma Sigma Honor Society, uh, Abu Dhabi University chapter. So uh, people in the University of Michigan, they definitely know about Beta Gamma Sigma Honor Society. And uh, additionally, I'm also the visiting professor at Burgundy School of Business, uh, Dijon, France. Uh, I have more than 20 years of uh, experience in teaching, consulting, and research uh, in a wide variety of uh, industries, including uh, manufacturing, telecom, education, healthcare, and utilities, et cetera. Uh, my teaching and consulting assignments are a bit uh, broad, uh, and it includes entrepreneurship uh, on and off. Uh, and uh, I have published a couple of papers along with Professor Nishat uh, and Professor Malios on entrepreneurship, uh, especially female entrepreneurship as well, and uh, strategy planning, organizational behavior, and leadership international management, and recently I've started uh, looking at the innovation perspective in uh, the small and medium enterprises as well as in large industries. Uh, um, I have also received scholarly awards and research grants from uh, various UAE and global funding agencies such as uh, Al Husson Gas and uh, Fulbright Scholarship USA. And uh, now in this session, uh, my co-author and I shall share uh, some interesting findings of our research uh, that underlie the choice of entrepreneurial mindset among UAE youth and uh, the role of higher educational institutions in inculcating higher education, uh, in the higher education, the entrepreneurship culture in today's youth. So the session outline is that we shall be talking briefly about our research where we are going to highlight our uh, the objectives, methodology, findings, and implications. And then we shall be also talking about the current status, the role of higher education, and the efforts of higher educational institutions uh, and governing bodies in Qatar, which has enriched the entrepreneurship culture in Qatar. And uh, we shall also be talking about the role of higher education and government bodies' efforts in the UAE context. And then we shall talk about uh, future directions and as well as some future areas to research further uh, in this. So um, uh, this is a paper that we have published in the Journal of Small Business and Enterprise Development. And the topic is entrepreneurial mindset and the role of universities as strategic drivers of entrepreneurship evidence from the United Arab Emirates. Uh, 
the, the purpose of this paper is to provide insight into the factors that influence the mindset of youth uh, in the United Arab Emirates uh, in choosing entrepreneurship as their uh, future employment. So these are the key objectives of this paper. So we talked about the factors that influence UAE uh, youth entrepreneurial mindset. We also looked at some of the strategic factors that affect the role of universities in improving entrepreneurial mindset. And then we, uh, the uni uniqueness of this uh, paper was one of the key objective was that we wanted uh, to establish the relationship among these identified strategic factors using interpretive structural mod modeling. So um, this was one of the thing that uh, is, means these are some of the key research objectives of our paper. Now, uh, the uh, we we uh, the the study was divided into two phases. Uh, uh, the first one was uh, survey method, and the second one was interpretive structural modeling. So, to achieve the research objectives, a questionnaire-based survey uh, and uh, ISM method uh, was used. And um, the, in in case of survey method, uh, what we did. First of all, an exhaustive literature review was done and we identified some of the uh, key factors uh, that uh, uh, influence the entrepreneurial mindset of the youth. And um, in, in that, uh, uh, we, it means, um, we uh, in case of methodology, uh, before applying the survey method, we used the stratified sampling method uh, to select the respondents based on their uh, uh, grades. The respondents were the university students. And the criteria was that those students who have attained B and above grade from four public and four private universities were taken as the respondents. A total of 400 questionnaires were distributed in person and by email. And uh, uh, with multiple follow-ups, et cetera, we received 244 uh, responses with a response rate of 61%. Now I'm going to just give you a brief uh, idea about uh, the respondents profile, who were the respondents. Uh, so it was 42% um, respondents were males and 58% were females. Uh, and um, among the male respondents, 54% males were working. And uh, in case of female respondents, only 27% females were working at that time. And uh, as this study was related to looking at entrepreneurial mindset, one of the key questions that, that we asked in that questionnaire was that, uh, have they attended any entrepreneurship course or not? So only 37% of the males and females uh, had attended the entrepreneurship related courses. So, and uh, we also analyze the data by two subgroups of males and females to understand their attitude towards uh, entrepreneurship. Now, the key findings uh, uh, of survey method was that, uh, or you can say empirical findings were, let me just uh, talk here, the youth, UA youth, um, uh, they ranked entrepreneurship as their first employment choice. Uh, however, most of them have not attended any formal entrepreneurship related course in the school or, uh, or in the colleges. So the study also suggests that individual and environmental factors influence the entrepreneurial mindset of both males and females uh, in the UAE. So these, these are uh, the brief uh, survey findings. Now I'm going to give the uh, 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 forum to uh, Dr. Nishat, who will be talking more about the unique model that we applied in this research, which was interpretive structural modeling. And then he will also be talking about the efforts, higher educational efforts, and in entrepreneurship education reforms that has been conducted so far. So thank you, Professor Fauzia. So what we did was after we identified these uh, variables through literature review and the survey method, we tried to develop a relationship model among them. 
the purpose of the relationship model was to understand that which uh, of these factors are strategic nature and which one of them are the resultant nature. So we use the ISM uh, approach, which is a very popular approach in a qualitative, uh, doing qualitative research. Some inputs from experts are required. So we have a group of experts from academia and the uh, industry. And we conducted a workshop. And after the uh, two, three, you can say, workshops, we finally developed this model. Uh, from this model, it is, uh, you can say, you can uh, easily infer that the strategic drivers are at the bottom of, the, of this uh, model, which is the positive interventions by the government then strengthening university industry interaction and developing synergies. This will obviously lead to the, uh, the variables which are, are at the higher level. That means if we want to have the technical skill improvement for the uh, uh, budding entrepreneurs, we cannot directly start from there. We have to establish incubation centers, which requires strengthening university industry interaction, which requires positive interventions by the government. So this model provides us an understanding that how the role of the university is important, which as you see that there are many things where the university role is very important. For example, strengthening university industry interaction, establishing incubation centers in universities, embedded entrepreneurial courses across curriculum. For example, as Dr. Fozia just mentioned that very few people who surveyed uh, around 30, 35% means they, all the others haven't gone through a formal entrepreneurship training courses anywhere in the university or others. So I will not talk about that, how this, uh, the things are changing here in the Middle East. Okay, I will talk about the uh, Qatar specifically, how entrepreneurial, you can say education and the focus on entrepreneurship is changing. Can you go to the next slide? please? So our paper mentioned uh, that there are three major roles of universities in promoting entrepreneurship. Number one is creating a culture of entrepreneurship. Number second, providing specific courses where students can learn more and then specific training programs that they can do. Uh, the next slide. Yes, so you see that the the, the the focus on entrepreneurship in Qatar has started or has a major uh, push by Qatar National Vision, Vision 2030, which mentions that the private sector has to play a major role in the economic development. And because the government wants to, you can say, diversify the economy, move from hydrocarbon based economy towards other industries. So the government is supporting the development of private sector and the Tata National Vision, it's the, the document itself says that the challenge is to, you can say, to enable private sector, which requires training and support for entrepreneurs as a precondition for private sector. So what the document says is that the government should provide financial and non-financial support mechanisms that will help incubate and grow small and medium scale enterprises. If you remember, this was our first and the most important factor in our model that we developed in an ISM, that the support from the intervention by the government. And the same thing is coming from the Qatar National Vision 2030. Uh, so the government wants to move from hydrocarbon towards knowledge-based economy, which will be focusing on innovation and entrepreneurship. Next slide, please. So in, in looking into, the, into this vision, Qatar University being the only national university in the state of Qatar has, uh, you can say, have several initiatives that is going to support the entrepreneurship. One of the major initiatives at Qatar University is that uh, Office of Strategy, Innovation, Entrepreneurship and Economic Development has been established around four years ago at President Office, directly under the President of the University, and it offers a wide range of, uh, you can say, training programs. It, it, it partners with the, uh, with the government agencies like the Development Bank and other, you can say, training, training centers to provide uh, business development assistance, incubation. So this office is directly working under the, the president office so that the different, you can say, uh, stakeholders 
can easily be contacted, can easily come up to improve the uh, entrepreneurship and support the entrepreneurship in the, uh, in, in the state of Qatar. Next slide. The other important thing that happened in 2013, way back, was uh, an, a national competition, which is known as Al Fikra competition. The latest edition is 2022. So this is an yearly competition, national entrepreneurship competition, which is designed for higher education, like uh, you can say teams. And there are two groups. One is the junior idea track, where the and for undergraduate student, the other is a senior idea track. So this competition has become quite popular in the last five, six, seven years. And it is directly supported by, as you see, by the Office of the Strategy Innovation and Development at Qatar University and Qatar, Qatar Development Bank. Both of them, they contribute to, you can say, come together to support. And this is a national level competition that promotes the innovation and entrepreneurship in the state of Qatar. Next slide, please. Now, with regard to the second point that I mentioned, so this was all about creating the culture for entrepreneurship. The second point, if you remember in our paper, as I mentioned, was offering courses, specific courses that are uh, related to entrepreneurship. So in that direction, College of Business and Economics, which is the college where I teach, uh, as CBE, we call it at CBE, so College of Business and Economics, Qatar University, first we started a minor in entrepreneurship which was offered only to business students but looking into the importance of this entrepreneurship and the focus of the government on entrepreneurship from this year fall 2022 this minor has been open to all the students of the university so any student who in any colleges we have around eight to nine colleges any student can uh, enroll in entrepreneurship as a, as a minor. So a person might be working in the school of engineering. He might be a student in school of arts and sciences. He or she might be a student in even in uh, Sharia or law. This minor is open to all. Though, so the courses that you see here are all that focus on creating an entrepreneurial, uh, you can say mindset for the students like entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial innovation mindset, innovation management. Then other than this offering this entrepreneurship courses by CV, there is also a center for entrepreneurship and organization ex excellence. This center is under the College of Business and Economics because we are directly in contact with businesses. So this center creates training programs, uh, research and consulting, community contact so that the students can, uh, you can say, benefit from these uh, entrepreneurial training programs and, and so on. Uh, this pro uh, center also provides conferences and workshops on the entrepreneurship. So starting for the first, the culture, where I we show that it is coming from the national vision towards the how the university, what the role university is playing in this, and then coming to the offering of the courses by the CB. Can you go to? So in addition to the, uh, you can say, uh, what the university is doing, Qatar Development Bank is a major entity that supports, uh, supports entrepreneurship in uh, the state of Qatar. In addition to their major role where they provide financial support, you can say the seed, seed money for the projects, they provide a long, you can say, list of the training programs all the year around to the uh, uh, to the to the people who want to go into this entrepreneurship so for my side this is about what is happening in the state of qatar uh, and now i will uh, give back to dr fozia to talk something about the ue uh, if you're speaking you're muted can you please make sure you're um yeah. Yeah, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nishat, uh, for uh, telling about the entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, uh, in, uh, in context of Qatar. Now I shall be giving you a glimpse of uh, uh, efforts, uh, especially boosting up the entrepreneurial ecosystem in the UAE context, uh, keeping in mind the higher education side and the governance body side. So, um, well, uh, I'm going to start with uh, that there, there are a range of 
uh, initiatives that has been started by the higher educational institutions in the Middle East. Uh, even my um, uh, co-author and friend, Professor Nishad, has also pointed out in other context. So um, uh, I will be talking about the UAE Vision 2030, uh, 2031, and uh, especially UAE, uh, the UAE Vision 2031 and the National Entrepreneurship Agenda. So the unique thing what UAE government have done this time is that they have not taken entrepreneurship as one of the key pillar. They have just made it as national entrepreneurship agenda. So to promote the entrepreneurship uh, in, in, in the country itself. And this indicate that the creation of an entrepreneurship ecosystem is uh, one of the main goals of the UAE government uh, and the, um, the all the entities uh, for the future. And the mission of this national entrepreneurship agenda is to include entrepreneur education in the educational system as educators who provide entrepreneurship education uh, develop students' entrepreneurial mindset, knowledge, and skills. So as you can see here, the, so, uh, some of the key features of uh, UAE Vision 2031 and the National Entrepreneurship Agenda is that the UAE will become the entrepreneurial nation by 2031. And uh, the, uh, second, they are aspiring to become the home to 10 unicorn startup companies by 2031. And I'm sure that the way they are looking at or the way they are formulating the entrepreneurial uh, development strategies, uh, it's not 2031, maybe in two to three years, the, the uh, this startup company's um, uh, vision will be achieved. And the third uh, agenda of, uh, or the vision from UA Vision Pardon the interruption, I'm, I'm sorry for the interruption. Uh, just as a time check, we have uh, 10 minutes remaining for this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the third one is one of the uh, to become one of the top three countries in the global entrepreneurship index. So just to give you an idea that this agenda was set by uh, the UAE government and uh, uh, it was that in 2031, uh, we have to achieve one of the, we have to be in top three countries in the global entrepreneurship index. But uh, to uh, I mean, the good surprise or the good thing is that uh, uh, the uh, according to the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor GEM, um, they have ranked the UAE first globally in its Global Entrepreneurship Index 22, uh, 2022 already. So uh, so the, the aim of being top three countries in the Global Entrepreneurship Index has already been achieved. The only thing is this, that is UAE going to continue the legacy or continue the stride, entrepreneurial stride in the near future or in the longer run as well. So um, I, here I'm going to talk something about uh, the key initiatives uh, uh, which the higher educational institutions along with the uh, government bodies have uh, done. So as we all know that instilling and promoting the entrepreneurial values at a younger age is the key to unlock both individual and economic potential of uh, incredible scale. So while a number of high schools and early education centers in the UAE are introducing children to the principles of entrepreneurship, um, that, that means uh, as a form of the general education, um, I find university to be an environment most favorable uh, to truly ingrain a deeper understanding and passion for entrepreneurialism. So in our academic ecosystems in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, an increasing number of universities are driving up their entrepreneurship offerings. Uh, the, some of the things what higher educational institutions and the other schools and colleges have done, uh, based on the directives of Ministry of Education, uh, uh, most of the means we have implemented a government directive to include introductory entrepreneurship courses as part of the general education curricula uh, to all federal and private university and college under undergraduate programs in the UAE. So this is one of the major thing. 
because if you remember that one of the findings of our research was that only 37% of the students were means or uh, um, they attended the entrepreneurship related courses at any level so you can just imagine that even in the schools the entrepreneurship education was very limited or there were there were no entrepreneurial education at that time uh, in the UAE, education uh, educators mainly offer entrepreneurship courses in business programs uh, but as Professor Nishad has pointed out, many of the universities have opened uh, this entrepreneurship course to the uh, to different streams, to different colleges, irrespective of whatever their disciplines are, whatever their specialization is. Because entrepreneurship is a domain where you, even if you are doing any arts degree, you can open an entrepreneurial venture or startup. You can have a startup idea and so on. Um, some universities also provide specialized programs on entrepreneurship and innovation, both at the undergraduate and graduate levels. Um, uh, and uh, here, one of the key findings of our research was promotion of incubators and accelerators. So this is one of the uh, means the, the in in the recent uh, recent time there is a surge of incubators and accelerators in the UAE and uh, even in Qatar uh, to promote the entrepreneurial ecosystem or to develop the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So. There are so many uh, university-based incubators. Uh, Dr. Shabin, um, yes. we, have, we, uh, five, we have five minutes left, actually. But I wanted to ask, uh, it, uh, yes. I really appreciate the context. It's very interesting to learn in the GCC context, the amount of effort, strategic effort, investment happening. I'm also curious what the key um, findings were in your study, in your co-authored mm -hmm. study about um, the the test on whether or not uh, entrepreneurialism as a sensibility is seeding. Uh, if you do have those results, I, I would love for you to uh, highlight those as we uh, finish up our last five minutes. OK, OK. Uh, well, I'm going to talk uh, some of the key findings of our research, although I have we have already talked about the research in brief. But the key findings of our research was that uh, um, I'm going to talk about the empirical research as well as we are going to talk about the ISM. So the results of the empirical research uh, suggested that uh, youth of UAE, they ranked the entrepreneurship as their first employment choice, although they were not exposed to any entrepreneurial related course. This was one of very surprise, well, means we were surprised about that finding. And um, uh, uh, our key finding is also that uh, individual and environmental factors influence the entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial mindset of both males and females in the UAE. So there is no gender difference in entrepreneurial mindset. And if you will see that uh, uh, we promote female empowerment and so on, so there is no differentiation between that who will become an entrepreneur, whether it's a male or female. And uh, the, the USP or the unique uniqueness of this study was the structural model which Professor Nishat has all, already talked about, uh, which indicates that uh, give, uh, to give an impetus to the entrepreneurial uh, mindset, the government must create a supporting environment with UA universities playing the role of a catalyst. So, so looking at that catalyst point, there were so many factors, strategic factors or enablers. We, we, uh, we looked at from the relationship modeling point of view and then we highlighted the key findings, like for example, Professor Nishat has also pointed out in Qatar what efforts have been done. Um, uh, and coming back to, so these were the, I mean, these were the major findings. Now I will be highlighting quickly about the role of incubators and uh, uh, accelerators, which is one of the, um, key findings uh, from our research and which has been implemented by the government here in the UAE. So um, uh, the key initiative here was the incubator and accelerator. I hope Professor Muzammil, um, uh, the things are okay? No, uh, that, thank you. That was a very, very uh, clarifying uh, review uh, of the key findings. It helps me situate uh, yeah, what yeah. you have presented. Uh, yeah. And so you actually do have, uh, we can extend time by, by a couple of minutes. So we have four four more minutes if you'd like to continue okay. the plan presentation. Yeah, I would like to, yeah, yeah. yes, Professor. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind me, uh, because all of us are highlighting what the government has done, 
but in the means i just want to add maybe about a minute that uh, what uh, on our based on our experience what we are finding it here that what is happening particularly uh, uh, in qatar what we found in the because if you if you know that for four years qatar was on blockade and there was no you can say communication with any of the uh, you can say uh, neighboring states so in the in those years uh, and what i what i have observed that uh, what is lag, lacking here in uh, i i'm not i i don't know about ua but in in qatar what i found that what is lacking is that there are very few ventures which are based on technology most of the time the entrepreneurs uh, people who wants to start a businesses they want to do it for some uh, you can say uh, some uh, something which is you can call it as a mom and pop shops like that they there are very few ventures which are driven by technology and that is why the rate of failure of entrepreneurial ventures is very high um, particularly if we look around we will find that there is a lot of failures which we probably there is no data about it but the rate of failure is also high because the cost of running a venture here in qatar is very very high because you don't have the workforce that you can uh, that can work so you have to bring the people from outside the same in ue so the cost of hiring the people is very high uh, providing them the insurance providing them the uh, uh, accommodation all of this cost a lot to the entrepreneur then mm -hmm. in addition the, the the cost of rent and everything is very high so all this contributes to you can say a lot of stress on entrepreneurs uh, to generate quickly uh, which is a very difficult thing I don't know what Dr. Fazia has. Uh, Thank you yeah. for for Abs that, um, so Dr. Fazia. If you could uh, summarize in the last minute and a half, we can actually turn to the Q and A where we can expand further with uh, greater dialogue. Well, uh, I just want to add here that uh, means as you can see from the slide, uh, UAE has offered. Although Professor Nishad has talked about Qatar context, here uh, the UAE is focusing more on technology and uh, technology focused incubators. So, which you can see that we have multiple incubators, uh, in the independent in incubators as well as university based incubators, which support. Even I would like to talk about Abu Dhabi University's ADUI Sustainable Venture Development Lab, where we collaborate with. The, and the main objective here is to incubate the selected initiatives from Abu Dhabi University students, faculty, staff, and the selected relevant community members. Uh, and the main focus is to achieve the sustainable development goals, so SDG. And um, uh, now, uh, just to conclude uh, in the way forward, that uh, if we want to improve the entrepreneurial ecosystem, uh, we need to uh, embed the technology aspect. Uh, we are good in technology. UAE is one of the key exporter of technology, but we have to align with the, uh, and we have to see how universities can play a pivotal role there. And uh, we, as Professor Nishad has talked about that, uh, how to promote and appreciate the ethnically diverse groups, um, because it's a multicultural diverse environment and how we can reduce the cost of hiring. Uh, uh, another uh, way forward is to link curricula to real world business challenges, which is uh, a very common phenomena, but it has not yet been practiced here in the UAE or in Middle Eastern context and uh, create opportunities for students to participate in, participate in social entrepreneurship context, uh, contests instead of just entrepreneurship contests, because at the end of the day, we have to make them feel for what is the uniqueness of their entrepreneurship venture. And the future research directions are, the, as a researcher, we feel that uh, many things need to be done in this context. Uh, or, or in other words, miles to go before we sleep. We have to do a lot of things. Although many things have been explored, entrepreneurship literature is very diverse, very much uh, researched in the developed country countries context. But in the transition economies, in the emerging economies con context, especially in the Arab countries context, the, the there are many things that we need to explore further. So that's uh, two cents from our side, and uh, we are happy to take any questions. Well, thank you. Thank you both for um, uh, 
providing uh, you know the original findings and, and and contextualizing it so well for uh, many of us coming from different contexts. Uh, it was both informative in, in a deep way and also uh, with a helpful broad understanding. So let's welcome all of our uh, four presenters from both presentations back into the room now. Um, and this is a great time if you're joining us from the public audience. Uh, although we can't see you, um, we know that um, actually this is the most popular session so far by registration uh, of our uh, events so far. I know there's a great deal of interest. Please provide your questions through the question tool on Zoom, and I will bring them in as, uh, as submitted uh, into a discussion. We have approximately uh, five to 10 minutes for this public Q&A, after which we'll take a five minute break and then reconvene with the students uh, in this course. Um, let me see if there are questions awaiting. Okay, so we're waiting for some questions to come through. Um, I'll, uh, I'll process that while I provide a, a starter question. Um, now, we entitled this uh, session, uh, Higher Education and Reformation uh, Between the Themes of Debate and Innovation. And I know these are broad, high-level concepts that you have operationalized differently in your different projects. Our first project was very historical and humanistic, uh, applying a different way of thinking and structuring interaction. And our second project was very social scientific, uh, looking for evidence in uh, organizational settings of uh, change and, and, and uh, an effect of a variable on certain uh, independent variables. Um, but I wanted to draw this link at a, at a high level. Uh, in which ways do you, you see um, the other concept uh, interacting with your current conceptual realm? So, um, so you know, Doctors Faisal and Jabin, uh, is um, do you see value or possibility in a better formats to debate competing ideas to drive the process of risk taking, uh, information processing, uh, and decision making? It's something as uncertain as innovation, where there's not a given recipe for success, where you have to make uh, instinctual but also informed decisions. And for doctors Kuchukural and Oruch, um, you know, uh, when doing, uh, when uncovering your research on debate uh, practices uh, from established traditions that have been underlooked, uh, do do you see? the lens of innovation or identifying innovations in the past that are relevant in the present or or do you see yourself providing innovation in established practices from the past to bring them to the present how do you work with this other concept from from the other realm so i'll let you, you know either team uh, engage first while i uh, also process the questions coming in from the public forum so who would like to have their you know uh, first turn i guess so, uh, means, uh, so uh, actually, what uh, I understood is that you probably you you uh, want our ideas about how we can um, how the this uh, you can say the innovation and decision making can we make more uh, you can say uh, what you call it as more systematic or something like that it means uh, this is something that you are asking. Yeah, I'm, I, it's, and if you, uh, I'm broadly asking whether the current culture and practices surrounding yes, yes, yes. debating differences of opinion ideas in your environment are they handled well? I'll give you a very basic example. I'm a I'm I'm an advent uh, follower of the TV show Shark Tank, and I uh -huh. see a lot of debate in that show. So I know uh, innovation entrepreneurship requires debate. I don't know if all of it is productive or healthy, but it's interesting. Uh, so how do you think about ethics of debate that lead to more productive? Yeah, okay, I got it. So uh, for, for, for means uh, in context of uh, these here countries like Qatar and UAE, uh, uh, we don't have such, uh, you can say, uh, a debate culture where uh, people can discuss their ideas and uh, they do sometimes when they start their uh, you can say they go to some uh, what you call it as the incubators they have some experty expert advices uh, but in in the, what what we, i feel personally is that they uh, many of them they don't have that experience of really working in the business 
they don't have that interaction with uh, you can say how actually the real businesses work probably some of them they are in the government organization they have uh, some money saved from their uh, you can say from their uh, salaries they want to invest uh, so this as you said that uh, probably across uh, for example as one of the thing that we stress in our research was that there should be a inter university dialogue uh, which is still missing we don't have much contact although uh, outside people considered gcc or mena as one uh, people would not differentiate between the qatar uae saudi bahrain but there is a not a lot of dialogue happening between countries uh, universities in these countries and this is, this is what i feel that it is lacking yet thank you yeah uh, i just want to add one point here thank you professor nishat uh, for for this point yes i totally agree that uh, there is uh, a very limited dialogue like for example when you say limited dialogue now we have started doing research with the uh, uh, means inter university researchers or you can say uh, means in, in other countries and so on even the universities are promoting the foreign collaboration the uh, mena region uh, colleagues collaboration and so on um uh, in terms of inculcating or, or promoting uh, this debate culture to 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 showcase your innovation requires uh, as professor nishat has also point out that uh, students they they lack experience so here i would like to point out the lack in uh, lack in the inter in internship culture as well uh, how many universities uh, first of all the question is that how many universities offer entrepreneurship major or entrepreneur they have embedded uh, uh, entrepreneurship education in their programs uh, the second thing is how many exclusively entrepreneurship focused internship is there how many business students or how many students have shadowed the real entrepreneurs how many and i have seen uh, um, and i would like to tell you here uh, that because of the cultural constraints people are more interested in listening to the success stories there are no mention of the failure stories so so when you look at the pitching or when you look at the risk taking or innovation um the success and failures these are the two facets okay you need to learn about if you uh, cherish the the success you should also be able to know about the failures so that you're better prepared for that so there are many things which are still at a very early stage i'm not saying that none of the universities or there are no efforts for that we are definitely making significant strides we are making significant efforts in improving the things but uh, yes uh, there are many things that we have not yet achieved so that's my two cents in innovation and risk taking and i i would like to tell munazra uh, uh this debate should uh, definitely be incorporated in entrepreneurial pitching and i have just started thinking about how you know I, I feel i feel the same oh i'm sorry to interrupt i i feel the same i think there's a great portability in uh discussing uh, merits and demerits possibilities and risks uh, with different trajectories and this structure of listening and responding seems very productive. Uh, so if, in order to draw the debate uh, team, the Munazara team into the discussion, I wanted to pose two questions that have come in from the public and feel free to engage with anything that has already been uh, discussed so you can decide. And after this, we'll conclude for our five minute break. So uh, one question from uh, uh, one of our master's students, Zhen Yang Yu, is um, uh, that uh, she has recently joined uh, in the University of Michigan the Arabic Debate Club. So first of all, I did not know we had one. That's very interesting for me to learn. Uh, and the question is, uh, she believes that the real implication of Munazara is more complicated than what she's experiencing in the Arabic Debate Club, which is, um, to summarize, instead of simply denying the opposite side's argument, they their current practice as she's experienced it, they break down the argument, define the title and subject, so they, they deconstruct it, and then they try to come up with a better statement than the opposite side. But her question is, she believes the real implication or application of Munazara might be more complicated than that. 
Could you please clarify the procedure? A related question from Ahmad Taylor, also a master's student in our International Regional Studies program, is that um, a, contextual, a contextual question of transferring this structure to the real world. So what are potential issues you anticipate that may arise in exporting this Munazara practice to the current Middle Eastern state society context? So if I can add a few levels to this, um, in what you see and observe as current Middle Eastern social context, it's a diverse region, many societies, um, I think it, it may implicate thinking about, to, uh, do we see this structure had healthily adopted? Are there going to be uh, reactions involved that you can anticipate? And particularly at the level of, of state actors receiving them many, in many cases where there's not exactly an open public sphere promoted by certain states which are run uh, autocratically, uh, certainly in the region, which I don't think is very easily contested. So there's a lot of interest in the Munazara team, I know from our presenters themselves, but two of our students are very interested in these two levels. You know, first of all, uh, thanks, thanks for the question. Uh, for Zhang Yang, I, I, I'm hoping that, you know, I'm not butchering your name, I'm very sorry. Uh, so I'm very happy that, you know, there is a club where you have people who are debating in this manner. To be honest, this is something that we are, we, we lack, we cannot see this happening. Yes, in a sense, you know, the whole interaction is actually built toward these goals. And, but I'm not sure how the, it's practicable, it's practicability and its application in the other examples. You know, the example we have shown is clearly, it's like, you know, just to make, you know, this, we just exaggerated and we gave a very caricaturized version of what happens there. But we believe that, you know, there is a, there is a rationality behind it. And we believe that, you know, contemporary models actually foster individual skills and argumentative capacities in that sense we are and also i'm very happy that you know you have experienced this in uh, in the michigan university but what we are trying to do in terms of you know the the, the basic idea we have is that you know this the simplest this very simple uh, procedural changes and some adjustments designed for a dialogical interaction and we are imagining that you know uh, having this habituating getting used to these kinds of uh, the getting used to the other party and not go, let's say, you know, in terms of our the procedure, like, you know, not starting with just with your counter argument, but instead learning to help the other party. You know, this, this seems to be very easy. And like, you know, you, uh, this seems to be very easy, but imagine a debate between two polarized sides. And that, you know, let's say you have one party arguing that you know we have to do something with the mass shootings we have to ban the guns we have to ban the guns and we need to do something and then there's this other party you know we are we uh, this government this whole united states is based on militia working uh, and rebelling against the authorities so you have two polarized sides on an issue and can you imagine one of the sides instead of coming with their counter arguments in the beginning, can you imagine them helping the other party? Yes, explain me your role, explain me your premises, explain me why uh, you know, the US is built, in, uh, is built through the weaponry. So I like, it's very easy, it seems very easy, but to be honest, I don't have the capacity, I myself, I don't have the capacity to restrain myself, habituate these virtues, and adjust myself to the procedure so far. I hope that you know this is going to be better. I hope that you know I have explained this idea of habituation through practice and turning into a character trait. This is what we are looking for. And the second question, uh, to, yeah, to be honest, I personally have not, uh, have not thought about this issue. We, we have debaters in our club, uh, in our center. They have this, you know, we have this issue of context and how these things already in uh, tournaments, they have these kinds of problems. Uh, but what I believe is like, you know, at least for the time being, instead of acting like a rebelling organization, trying to promote free speech and the, the uh, freedom of the, the freedom of the, the, the global South, first we will focus on the issues uh, that we all share, maybe not to the specific context, 
this, we are not going to uh, focus on the context specific issues that might happen in UAA, on the Gulf, or in China. So the first idea is to meet in a middle ground. And I'm very happy to discuss this issue later as well. Thank you. Wonder, did you have any uh, 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 thing you wanted to share or um, shall I, may I add to what Rahmi said, yani, this procedure has been applied for centuries, actually it disappeared. You shouldn't forget this. Actually in this building where now Muzammil is sitting with us, they used to actually practice this debate. Yeah, this background, I'm actually just in a small room in, in, <laughs> in this background picture. Exactly, and the funny thing is, I, I am asking, and we were discussing the, how on earth the British style become hegemon today is a, is a question, actually. You should, we should also ask on the other way around. So why, so why don't we so create a procedure or a, a space that we can actually hear the other party speaking and hear two sides speaking to one another? I think it's, it is you know, definitely, it was possible and we can make it possible, but the challenge is, of course, now, as Rahmi was saying, there are deep disagreements in the society and people do not share same, let's say, epistemic uh, assumptions today. And there are many divergences in very deep epistemological, ontological levels. There, uh, it, and also the conception of truth, there, it, 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 there it's a challenge actually. And it, 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 for instance, if two parties, we, we, were, we are discussing this, if they, they understand the deep disagreement starts with a very basic, uh, low level kind of like fundamental issues, then the debate resorts to downgrades, uh, how do you say, uh, more fundamental issues. This is a challenge, let's say, we, now we are discussing in this deep, already divided uh, global uh, context. Thank you so much um, for, for engaging these public questions. Um, uh, I know they, they've been, um, big questions and, and, and they require a lot of discussion, uh, but you've provided a, both a, a great start into your programs of research. So uh, at this time, uh, it is um, one thirty-five Eastern in Michigan, which means that we'll be concluding the public Q&A discussion. For those of you who joined us from the public, thank you for, for, for joining us and being part of the series and for your questions. Um, we will now take a break uh, and we will reconvene with our students and our experts today uh, for a roundtable discussion. Uh, so please set a timer on your end for five minutes and uh, we'll, we'll be back in the room and we'll be able to see each other in the, in the intimate room uh, as well. Thank you so much. <laughs>